I'm Mandeep Kaur Nija, and this is my hometown of Hitchin. In the 60s, many South Asians moved to the UK, and some, like my family, moved to Hitchin in the hope of starting a new life abroad. We, their children, were the first to be born and raised in this country, and so I'm interested in exploring how other children of the diaspora, particularly women like myself, shaped and navigated their hybrid identity as British Asians in Hertfordshire. I want audiences to resonate and relate with the people in this film who paved the way for a new and multicultural definition of what it means to be a British Asian. Marriage was quite, yeah, it was quite it was a challenging one. I met the guy in June, you know, got married in August. Um, it was very fast paced. I don't think I really had that time to process it, but you become very acceptable to it, don't you? You know, because that is how, that is part of, a massively part of our culture. You know, we don't think about non-acceptance, you know, or anything different. So yeah, it was, it was, I mean, it didn't work out. And I came back home after two months. Um, but I think the, the impact it had on me was more for my mum. So I'll try not to get emotional right now. It was more for my mum. I think, you know, my dad wasn't around. He's passed away when I was 17. I was 21 when I got married. And I just think, that I more think of the pressure on my mum more than anything. And I think there's a part that felt really guilty like it happened and I you know and I did everything you know to make the marriage work you know I went to the Gurdwara every day like prayed to God and you know and I think the the impact I think the pressure the impact on me was is more to my family you know like she put so much like like money into it she saved up all her life my dad wasn't a very well person so he wasn't really working throughout his life you know or he had jobs but a mum worked three jobs at a time just to just to raise us three kids really um, so when it didn't work out, the person who arranged a marriage was from Letchworth um, and they have a, a, a massive network of family. So it was difficult for, for us to walk down the street because there's always this girl's fault, what has the girl done? And it had nothing to do with me and they, they came to that conclusion after. Um, so yeah, I think the pressure with that was it was massive, it's, it's huge. You know, like, and it's like it was repetitive as well because my mum is so well known in Letchworth. You know, we got the hitch in the surrounding area and Bulldog, and it became like an everyday talk amongst people at the Goodwala, like, and the pitiness on their voice work, I was like, why didn't it work out? And, you know, and it's, I think, I felt, I mean, I was kind of away from it. It's all more like with the aunties and, you know, like the mum every time. And I think it became a bit like, yeah, it was, it was awful for my mum. You know, looking back now, I didn't appreciate it as much when mum was, what my mum was going through. It's more like, oh my God, I'm divorced now. Like, you know, in, in our culture, once you're divorced, who's going to marry you now? Like, so, you know, there's a lot of, like, stigma attached to it. There's a lot of conditions attached to it, you know. And so in Letchworth, I mean, I wanted to move out. <laughs> like, I literally wanted to move out because I was, like, the talk of the town, you know. And, um, and the impact, it was, yeah, it was quite significant in a way that, yeah, the, the impact on our family. And it's just trying to kind of create a balance, really, you know, with what happened. But, you know, looking back now, and I had a wicked wedding day. <laughs> got to wear, you know, got to wear all the jewellery and everything, you know, you know, and it's not something I would ever change. You know, I would never change it. I think anything in my life, it's not, there's no regrets, there are any changes. I just, like I said earlier, I think it, it was more of the fact of my mum. You know, she didn't have like a husband to lean on and she doesn't have family here, they're all in India. I mean, she's got cousins, but it's not always the same. Like, she's got her friends. It, yeah, I just felt the way. I did feel a lot for my mum. So yeah, after the divorce, um, coming back back into the community, um, yeah, I did start turning into a bit of a rebel. <laughs> you know, I start to go out. I'm thinking, I've done everything now. Because I'm, I'm such a massive God believer, and I'm thinking, I did everything by the books and why did this divorce happen? Like. I served my husband very well. I got up in the morning at six o'clock, made the whole family, you know, masala egg, <laughs> scrambled egg and everything. Do you know what I mean? So I didn't know where, where the fault was for it to happen. So it was very much like I became like, I, I did become an unbeliever. I kind of gave up on God. Um, turned to drink, um, which, it, which is it's 
self was self harming in its form. I didn't stop going to the Gurdwara, stop going to parties, stop going to even social any any Indian community. You know, I just thought you not don't you lot don't care. <laughs> you know, like my mum's like my we haven't got I haven't got my dad around the pressure. My mum was it was awful. Sorry. And at the time, I, I was. I'm using the word selfish, but not in a way that, you know, I didn't care, but I just think I was so into what happened to me. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I was like, you know, my mum's lost like her husband and like, she hasn't got a family here. And I just wanted to make it better for her. And I just didn't know how to. And then when you got other people saying awful things to my mum, my family, like she was at fault for what happened. It just, you know, she had to like walk down the street like with everyone in lecture who created the marriage. Like it was awful. Like my mum should it never put her head down, like be walking in shame for something someone else did. So that was like, and I felt like I wasn't. I was trying to always like it's like I was trying to make up for something I never did. I was making up for their mistakes, you know, and you know, and I. It's just, it was just awful. It was just awful looking back, like for my mum. But and again, I, as I said earlier, I never really fully appreciated it, what mum was going through. It was more the case of like, oh my God, I'm divorced now. Like, I'm not good enough now. And that's the, you know, this, this honouring part about honouring God and honouring your culture. And I think it is so misplaced. You know, it's so misunderstood. Like now, I'm, you know, I can. I mean, I went through depression. I went through a great deal of deep anxiety to the point I didn't leave my house for two years. I didn't want to see anybody. Um, you know, when I went to, you know, to get assessed by the mental health team because I was literally just crying all the time. I was thinking, just get an answer from God. Like, why has this happened? And yeah, and even in that silence, I couldn't really express anything with the mental health nurses. It was it's a struggle because I didn't want to feel like I was dishonouring my family by telling the truth at the same time. You know, mum's a very private person, you know, my whole family is. And we know in our culture it's very much like that, isn't it? But at the same time, we do need to talk about it, you know, in in a, in a, in a honest form of light, you know, that this did happen to me. You don't have to bad mouth anybody, but it's, it's, it's the truth. It's, you know, it's a real event. So... Yeah, now I didn't get much support for the mental health services um, and due to the fact that I couldn't really, you know, be honest in, in what I needed to say. And the thing was, well, it was very conflicting in, at the same time because I'm thinking, I don't know. I don't know why I'm like this because in our culture, we don't talk about mental health. You know, we don't talk about anxiety or depression. So I didn't even know it was depression or anxiety. Um, and I think that's what happens, doesn't it? Like when you're unable to articulate you know, what you're going through in, you know, to save people, you know, I think, you know, it, it has a great impact on you to the point you, your, your life is just stopped. You don't know where your life is going. You don't know what your life is about, what the purpose is, you know. So, yeah, it was quite, it's quite a conflicting time. It's quite a lost moment for me, I'll say. Um, it's, I must admit, we are, there is changes happen now. I do see the changes and that's what I go and educate now, you know, with the educate, you know, ed education sector and the mental health and care sector. So for the last 12 years, I have been doing like talks and presentation, just talking about, you know, the deep aspects when it comes from, um, from the Indian community, you know, cause I was labeled with all sorts of diagnoses like schizophrenia, um, bipolar. And I was like, no, I just gone through trauma, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, don't label me. And, uh, every door was closed you know there were times where I got quite suicidal you know end up in hospital being assessed again my quietness was you know was yeah diagnosed with the three um earlier diagnoses that I mentioned to you but it was never the fact that there's a reason there's a root cause of this you know you know of my you know my silence so now I've turned that you know to a pain into a purpose now to serve others and educate others now I had a lot of people come from the Indian community, which I was really surprised actually. And the stories that came out with me, and it made me think, Usha, you're not the only one. You know, you're not the only one. And, you know, and I think if they didn't have a support network, you know, and I think there is a support network, but they don't know how to deal with what I was dealing with because I couldn't say anything. So how could they help me? I wasn't, it's like, you know, they're reaching out, but I'm not giving my hand. You know, it's a bit like that. So, yeah, so once I've done a holistic service, I started having customers from like 
like Gujarat and like India and all like, and, and all around UK. Um, and the stories I heard, it really, it, it, it honestly, it really, it actually get, it was part of my healing recovery as well. You know, so it kind of triggered a few things within me, in, within me. I think, God, I went through that as well. So it's like we're learning and healing with each other. You know, it's like this oneness going on. So, and from that, I've been, the last 16 years, I've set up a project, it's called Satya. It stands for South Asian and Culture and Honour. So this is what I go and out and educate people. So and it's all about transformation, hence the butterflies all around my room. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, even that's quite symbolic to me. Um, yeah, butterflies. I mean, I remember growing up as a child, like if there was anything that wasn't, I feel like it's harm in my peace, <laughs> you know, I would actually, there's always be a butterfly around. I think it was like a God-given sign that you're going to be okay. And, you know, it's just something that I felt really connected to. Very proud to present my Baba to you. Um, Baba was ahead of his time um, in the Punjab. He was the only one that was educated in our family. He went to college, could read and write English and speak it fluently as well. And although we were Punjabi and lived in the Punjab and had our own land and farm, he decided he just wanted a little bit more for his family. So he went overseas. Um, only my sister was born at the time, my eldest sister, Harmish and he tried to make a life in Canada. And this picture actually depicts his life when he was out there. Um, but what he did say was that it was a very barren landscape. Um, weather was terrible and the work was really tough. So we decided Canada wasn't actually gonna be for him. Papa arrived in Hitchin and stayed with my aunt and my uncle and then sent over the visas for us to arrive as well. And we arrived, um, my mum, my elder sister, my brother and myself in August 1970. And I remember I was six years old and terrified even of like the car journey, the escalators. I'd never seen an escalator in my life and I can remember to this day screaming because this moving staircase was just freaking me out. And we lived in one house, um, there were three families. There was my aunt, my uncle, her family, plus us, and then another relative as well. All five of us lived in one room, um, but that was just the way that it was. We kind of grew up um, in Kings Road um, at my aunt's house, and Hitchin was a place where we landed and have been ever since. Kings Road looks nothing like it does now. There were no cars on the street. We could play out there and nobody was going to run us over. Um, we had some lovely neighbours actually, quite a lot of Asian communities there and um, some um, black families as well. And um, loved it in that house, very social, always people coming and going. Um, but, but it was tough. We had the one bathroom and there were so many children and so many adults, but it was a happy time. And there was a park just literally at the bottom of the road where I learned to ride my bike. And Baba just used to put me on the bike and say, off you go, you'll be fine. And fall over, pick yourself up and off you go again. So that, that park's got some really nice memories for me. Obviously in India, you went out to the toilet in the fields because you had no running water, you had no toilets. And when I came here, I couldn't go to the toilet for two weeks. And in the end, out of sheer desperation, my mum used to have to go out and find a freshly ploughed field, which is what I used to crave for. And <laughs> it was just... But that was honestly little things like that that stick in your mind, even like the running water, the toilets, I just couldn't cope with it. So obviously I arrived in the August and then we had to wait for a placement for school. I was six, couldn't speak a word of English and all of a sudden I was, I was sent to this school. My mum remember her walking me and just leaving me there and I was terrified. I had all these children in the playground pointing and laughing at my feet and I couldn't understand what they were saying but all I knew is that it hurt because they were laughing at me. And then I realised why. It was because in India, the sh fashion for the shoes was the pointed shoes. And here, the children all had the rounded shoes. And I remember going home at the end of the day with my mum saying, I never want to go there again, mum. I don't know what they're saying to me. I don't understand. I don't like the food. Please don't leave me there. Bibi was brilliant. She um, realised the food was going to be difficult. So she used to make a bronta for me every day at lunchtime walk it over from King's Road to the Strathmore Infant School and she'd take me to the park next door. I'd sit on a swing and she'd feed me my bronta and, um, and then she'd walk back again. So that was, I used to really look forward to that because for me it was like almost like playing time as well as, as lunch time. So that was good. 
I would say that I started to notice feeling slightly different from my peers at Walshed Acre School. It was when the exclusion as to whether you were allowed to play or not was apparent because I was excluded as, as the Indian girl and my friend called Carol as a black girl. We weren't allowed to play chase with the boys and the girls. So I remember thinking, oh, okay, so they don't want to play with us because we're different. And that really hit home. And I can remember a time when um, at the weekend, for instance, all my aunties and, you know, my cousins, we used to get together and we used to go to the park. And we had to be quite careful in the park because I used to hear this expression of, be careful, the skinheads might be there. I had no idea what a skinhead was. And I remember going as a group of, uh, quite a few of us going to the park to play with, with all our relatives and the packy word being used. And I can remember saying to like some of my older cousins, what does that mean? What does pack, why are they calling us packies? I don't understand what that means. And it was then that it became apparent, actually you are different. You know, you are here in this country, but you're on the perimeters, you're on the periphery, you are kind of on the edge looking in. And, and that's when it really hit home. When I went to Hitchin Girls School, um, I was very fortunate, an all-girls school, that was the done thing, that's where you went as, a, as an Asian girl that, that was madiar at that age, you know, reached puberty, you didn't want to be mixing with the boys. What I struggled with, however, was the two personalities that I had. I had one personality going to school, I was just an, an average girl at 13, 14, um, going to school and being just like my white peers. Coming home, the moment you got in through that front door, you covered your legs, you covered your head, you changed out of those clothes and um, you were a totally different person. You came home, you washed dishes, you cooked and, um, and, and that was just the way that it was. So you became Calvinda at home. Whereas when I was at school, I was called Callie because they shortened it to Callie. So I was two different identities. I was very fortunate to be with a group of lovely girls. Um, I didn't really feel racially prejudiced at that time at all during my school days. Nobody kind of pointed to me and said, oh, you know, you're, you're different. They kind of greeted me with open arms and I had a really happy time there. So when I was at Hitchin Girls School, um, the girls used to get together, they'd go out and um, Grease was out, that the movie Grease with um, Olivia Newton-John and John Travolta, I was so desperate to see it. The hype, all my school friends went, all of my peers went and I wasn't allowed to go. It was an absolute no-no to cinema. You can't go to the cinema, you know, you'll get seen. And, um, and I remember the the girls at school were so supportive, they knew what I was going through, but they never talked about it. They never mentioned it, but they understood. And I remember one of my friends at school, um, I'm not going to name her in case she's um, still out there in Hitchin now, but she went to Woolworths and she borrowed um, the Grease album and um, she gave that to me, said, I know you've not been able to watch the film with us, but here you go, you can listen to the soundtrack. And I just thought that was the most wonderful thing she could have done for me. So, and I've still got that to this day. When um, you were a teenage girl at school, uh, you were not ever encouraged. In fact, it was frowned upon to go into further education. But I hang on by my teeth and I stayed at what they call junior sixth form. So I was allowed to stay after the fifth year, allowed to stay at junior six. And I got a fair amount of O-levels um, between me. Wasn't allowed to stay on for A-levels. Then I had two choices. You either get married or you get a job. And the job that I had lined up for me, courtesy of... of all of my aunties was a, as a machinist in a, in a firm that made the underwear, the brass Marks and Spencers called Furmark. And I remember going there thinking, oh my goodness me, just rows and rows of undies all doing the same thing. And I thought, I can't do this. I can't, I cannot work here. And, but in the meantime, I'd also been applying for jobs, looking in the local paper and applied for a job that came up with a land registry in Stevenage that prepare title deeds and I remember applying as an absolute junior at the bottom of the heap as a CA, a clerical assistant and I wasn't successful. I was on what they call a substitute list. I was gutted. So I had this looming start date for the factory as a machinist but luckily Stevenage Land Registry called to say there was a position for me and I started work there and that was where I worked and where I met my husband Paul now who I've been married to for over 30 years. So 
Paul and I worked together in a section called searches where we conducted searches of the index map and we were friends, good friends. He made me laugh, made me smile, just made me forget about things that were perhaps and the pressures that were on at home about getting married. We went on a Christmas meal, the whole group, the whole team went on a Christmas meal and it was at this meal we were both sat at different tables with our backs to each other and um, a song came on, Unforgettable by Nat King Cole. And at that precise moment, we both turned around and looked at each other and somebody snapped us. And this was a poignant moment. I thought, that's the man I want to spend the rest of my life with. So this was a pivotal point in my life. This was a turning point for me. I wanted to be with Paul, but also I knew it was going to be the most turbulent ride I'd ever been on in terms of being accepted um, by my community by my parents, and in my time, it was completely unheard of. You just did not marry a Agora. You didn't marry an English person. Nobody had done it, nobody did it. So I told my mum that, um, and my dad that I wanted to, to be with Paul, and they were literally, no, you're, this isn't going to happen. You're gonna bring shame to us. And it was at that, that point that I remember my mother crying and saying to me, I wish you'd never been born. I knew that I couldn't live without this man. I needed to be with him. And, and it was all based on a daytime relationship only ever at work for two years. That was, that was the basis. So I talk about myself taking a huge chance and, and changing you know, the course of my life, but I have to give some credit to my husband. He took a chance on a girl who was from a different culture he'd only ever known during the day, um, but he was prepared to, to give up his life in Stevenage to, to be with me. Although Paul and I were very happy together in Telford, it was the not knowing how mum was, how dad was, not being able to call, and that was really difficult. I remember crying all the way in the car when we made the journey to Telford, and I remember saying to Paul, are we doing the right thing? Have I done the right thing, Paul? Because I can't go back. I can't undo what I'm about to do and um, he was incredibly supportive and he said yes we are doing the right things time i remember him saying to me is a healer time will heal things you've just got to give it time and it did and i'd said to paul from the outset although we moved up in 1989 that i wouldn't get married until my family were able to, to come i didn't know until the wedding day itself whether my dad was going to come and i was absolutely delighted when he arrived and that wedding for me was just the most amazing day with my family there. And um, and it was just, I was so proud to have them all there and introduce them to all of my friends that I'd made in Telford over the years. Paul got promoted and he came back to London with his job. And so we had to move house, we had to relocate. And so it meant coming back to this area. And I wasn't ready to come back to Hitchin because I thought people were still going to point and people were still going to stare. So we actually chose to move to the perimeters of Hitchin, but still with it, be within touching distance. And I can remember people saying to me, what are your kids going to be? What future are you setting for your kids? They're going to be in no man's land. They'll be recognised as neither culture. You're, you're going to have kids and it's really selfish because they're not going to fit in. I know that I shouldn't say don't throw um, stones at glass houses, but when things started to happen within their own homes and their own daughters and their own sons started to kind of break boundaries, they realised actually this is becoming part of the norm. And what I had done in my day that was so horrific was actually nothing compared to kind of what the youngsters were doing now. We never did drugs, I never smoked, I never drank, never did any of that, I'm teetotal to this day. And yet youngsters now are a lot more freer and it's only when it happens in your own home that you realise not to be judgmental. So for us, it's been, for Paul and I, it's been a very difficult journey, but when I look now, I think, yes, you know, Life is a lot easier now for the youngsters that are growing up in Hitchin now, particularly for the Asian community. It's not frowned upon, it's just almost accepted as this is the norm, this is what's going to happen. So um, for my own daughters, um, going back to that woman who said to me, what are your kids going to be? They'll be neither here nor there. My kids are wonderful. They haven't lost out on anything. They have not deprived them of anything. We've given them the best opportunity in life that, that could be. I'm still a strict mother. I would never say to them, you're gonna have an arranged marriage, I will choose your partner, they can choose their own, but I am still quite strict, but they are free. 
they're free as birds to fly, which is something that we never had. Good people I met um, in Hitchin through friends, mutual friends um, that knew him and that knew my side of the family. Uh, we actually met November the 22nd, 1987. Um, and he'd actually just gone to Pakistan on a Yatra trip, because uh, I can remember him telling me that. And uh, we met at um, relatives' house, uh, relatives house. And back in the 80s, most people might know that you had to go to a room together, you know, sit there and have a chat. And we literally did meet for 10 minutes. Um, and that was all the time we had, or the only time we took to say, yeah, OK, we'll just marry each other. Um, and I know later on he would say to people, if people ask that sort of question, you know, you know, what, why did you marry Callie? He'd say, well, because of her eyes. <laughs> but Deep attended Hitchin Boys School. Um, and at the time it was a grammar school and he was actually very proud of proud of that um, and he talked really fondly even now he would talk fondly about Hitchin Boys School. I think at the time I think he might have been the only Sikh boy with a turban um, while there were other Sikh boys he was the one that had a turban and I think for him his achievement was attending a grammar school you know he came from India in 1962 um, and then to, to go on to actually do his 11 plus and then to be accepted um, as a minority group, he was very proud. I think, you know, one thing about Gurdip is that although he was hitched and born and bred, we've lived here in Stevenage for 25 years, you know, Gurdip was known everywhere. He, everybody seemed to know him. We couldn't go anywhere without somebody saying, you Gurdip from such and such, and you know. Um, and I think... You know, apart from his kind of his smile, people say to me all the time, you know, you, you, you know, deep smile. He always had a little sort of glint in his eye. I think what matters more for Gadeep than anything would be that what he left behind in terms of Sikhi values, helping others. You know, Gadeep always went out of his way. And I didn't really realise just how many people knew Gadeep. And I knew Gadeep had a, a big network, but it's only when he passed away that I realised what a big network he had. I think everybody that knew Gadeep, even a little bit, knew that he was very much into Sikhi. So when the opportunity came to work with um, the Sikh channel, I think he just couldn't not to take that opportunity. And he asked all of us and we said, why not? The kind of poppy kind of was almost a little bit of an accident because my dad was a soldier in the army. And I used to always say to him that I was by poppy because of my dad. And he then one day said, you know what? All those Sikhs in the um, army, and my kids both went to, um, in Belgium, um, to Ypres to see the, all the different, um, Sikh soldiers that were buried there and that was what gave him this impetus to have a, a, a poppy on the Kunda poppy which he did with a friend of his they just kind of literally thought let's just do this because that's what Gailey was like and that's how it kind of really came to fruition if you like and the one that he designed just very recently gave the little history so it came with a little backing to give you the seek history so I think really he's we've watched him progress with it and really enjoy it and every sort of late September October you know the amount of people that email in to say they want to buy a kind of poppy I think probably when Gertie passed away and I think it was I think everybody was shocked just how many people knew him and I think everybody was shocked including ourselves as to how much he'd actually done for other people. We had so many phone calls. People came. I could not believe the number of people that said, Gadeep did this for us and Gadeep did this for us and he never took any money. And I think that's probably his greatest achievement, that he was selfless. He really was selfless. Even in this home, he was selfless. He did whatever we asked him to do. He never didn't have the time. And that's what he was like with people out, out of this home as well, with the Sangat, if you like. He always, always had time. My dad used to take me everywhere. If I had an appointment in London, wherever it was, my dad would always say, Bhavan, I will take you, even though I could drive. And I remember saying to him, that, Dad, when I get married, I don't want that to stop. I still want you to be that person, you know? I, I don't want you to think, oh, you know, Bullen can take Bhavan everywhere now, um, or no, you know... I, I still want you to be, you know, that, that main person in my life. Just because I've got married doesn't mean that I don't want my dad 
just to still be a pivotal, you know, a main person um, for me. Um, and he always said, he always said to me, because before I was getting married, you know, it's a scary thing leaving home. And he always said to me that him and my mum will always fly with me. And I remember that so clearly. He was just trying to reassure me that I'd be okay. And I always remember that so clearly. He said, he, my dad was a funny person. He would always, my dad would always do funny gestures. And I remember him in my mum and dad's room physically saying, Bo, we're going to fly with you. And I won't ever forget that. <laughs>